The following is a letter, recovered from a data slate formerly in possession of Sheev Palpatine, on the nature of the Imperium of Man, addressed to Chancellor Sheev Palpatine, addressed by Admiral Thrawn. Salutations, Chancellor. I apologize for the extended amount of time spent without further communication. The journey to Axum and my research into this new foe has taken much longer than expected. This combined with my research into recovered artifacts, battlefield footage, and even the chance to talk to a few captured specimens has taken up much of my time these past few cycles. However, it is of my opinion that this sacrifice of time has been well worth the cost, as I believe I now understand this Imperium far more than your recommended amount of research time would have granted me. I will cut to the chase and explain what I have learned. First and foremost, the force we encounter now is a mere fraction of what is likely the totality of the Imperium of Man. Many recovered documents speak of these outsiders' home galaxy, and the one thing in common they all have is how they talk about the breadth and the scale of their domain. While some of the more outrageous estimates given by these documents could simply be written off as mere propaganda, in all likelihood the actual Imperium of Man is multiple magnitudes larger, both militarily and populationally. While the numbers thrown around these documents for both military and civilian populations vary wildly, it is safe to estimate militarily the Imperium of Man in their home fields at least trillions of troops in total, and is home to an almost mind-breaking number of more citizens. In regard to the culture of these outsiders, the best way to describe them is paradoxical. They simultaneously are both advanced enough to field weapons that rival even those of the ancient Rakatans, but so religious and afraid of anything alien to their way of life that it makes even me wonder how they got to this point. Religiously, the Imperials appear to worship a figure they know as the Emperor of Mankind. Worship of this figure appears to be mandatory, albeit with few exceptions for a select few groups within the Imperium. The core tenets of this religion are incredibly barbaric. The religion down to the core is inherently anti-intellectual, xenophobic, authoritarian, anti-technological development, and almost entirely uncaring. Their cult also makes up the backbone of their entire society, only few being exempt from its eye of doom. While not a creator deity in the traditional sense, nor an ever-permanent yet unwilling entity such as the Force, the Emperor is treated as if he is both and neither by the followers of this creed. According to documents recovered from places of worship dedicated to this Emperor of Mankind on the Imperial-occupied Axum, the Emperor is closest to what we would call a Saviour God. Their myths tell of a period of time before the founding of their Imperium, one where the lost tribes of mankind stagnated and fell apart, until the Emperor of Mankind reunited these tribes and created the Imperium of Man. As for why this Emperor of Man hasn't been physically present, the myths explain that he was betrayed by a number of demons, only to be saved from death by what the Imperium calls the Archangels and Angels of His Light, and placed on a device known as the Golden Throne, where he sits to this day. While there is much more to these myths, and I could spend much more time explaining them to you, I understand you will more than likely be completely disinterested in the minutiae of this cult, and simply wish to understand why I find it interesting. To put it simply, there is no way to untangle these myths from what little amount of their own history these outsiders seem to know. For all intents and purposes, it appears this emperor was a real being and did really create a polity known as the Imperium of Man. As well as this, we unfortunately know from experience the angels this cult speaks of are in reality the Astartes some of our forces have fought against, few living to tell the tale. This religion also extends deeply into almost every military organization within their Imperium, some such as the Sisters of Battle whom exist almost exclusively as the armed wing of their church. In addition, the religion naturally expands into the more front and center military aspects of the Imperium, such as their army whom they call the Imperial Guard. Within the Imperial Guard, worship of the Emperor is mandatory, and promotion of rank often corresponds with a degree of willingness to martyr oneself to their God. Surprisingly as well, this tends to also vary from regiment to regiment, some such as the Death Corps of Krieg 
is far more extreme in their zealotry and willingness to sacrifice oneself, while others such as the Cadians taking a far more relaxed position in their faith in comparison. Their religion, as to be expected as well, serves as a form of cultural and legal enforcement. Any and all thought outside of the bounds of their church is penalized harshly, and even the slightest degree of skepticism is met with execution or worse. Enforcement of these cultural and legal norms is usually administered through different channels. The civilian population is persecuted by a police force who they call the Arbitais. Low-level military personnel is persecuted by their higher-ups, and high-level military personnel and even outsiders are persecuted by what is possibly the most backward organization the Imperials have, the Inquisition. The Inquisition can best be described as an intelligence group and the foremost powerful intelligence group within the Imperium. While I do not know everything about this organization, it appears it is made up of several orders which focus on policing different aspects and forms of heresy the larger Imperium has declared. Some focus on suppressing and detaining force users, others focus on eliminating aliens from the larger Imperium, while others still focus exclusively on ratting out so-called heretics. The power this Inquisition has over the Imperium is completely unrivaled, even so much as a brief mention of their name strikes fear into even the highest ranking military and administrative personnel. In effect, they are the ones who really run the Imperium due to the power their position affords. Not even the so-called High Lords who head the bureaucracy of the Imperium can hold them to heel. On the note of how Imperial bureaucracy functions, it is of great importance we also address one of the few seeming exceptions to both Imperial religion and Imperial bureaucracy. This group, from what I have gathered, roughly translates to the Mechanicus, or the Adeptus Mechanicus. This group, as stated, seemingly exists outside of the larger Imperial polity entirely, almost as if it were an ally rather than an actual component of the Imperium, however, that would be a mistake to assume. The Mechanicus may have, at one point, been a mere ally rather than a component of the Imperial machine, but much like a symbiotic organism, it appears to have bonded to the Imperium so fully that both the Imperium itself and the Mechanicus depend on each other for their mutual self-interest. The Mechanicus, as the name suggests, deals with the maintenance and production of Imperial technology. As stated before, the Imperium by and large is paradoxically anti-technological development, fearing any sort of technological progress and even unauthorized maintenance of existing technology. This, of course, creates a massive issue for a technologically advanced and spacefaring polity, as common sense would tell you. The Mechanicus appear to be the answer to that problem, being one of, if not the only, organization allowed in the Imperium to maintain and produce technology of all kinds. Everything we see the Imperials use is manufactured and maintained by the Mechanicus, or at times few of their authorized exceptions. However, this does not mean the Mechanicus is without issues of their own in this regard. The Mechanicus, much like the rest of the Imperium, is highly religious, albeit worshipping a far different god than the rest of the Imperium. While I could go into extreme depth into the nature of Mechanicus's religion and culture, it would be best if I were as concise as possible. The Mechanicus appear to worship a being they call the Omniscia, or the Machine God, and importantly for the understanding of the Imperium as a whole, this god's teachings explicitly disallow invention. This is due to Mechanicus' belief that all wholly sanctioned technology has already been invented by mankind in the past, and to invent anything new would be an affront to the holy machines that already exist. This, as you can reason yourself, is a fact that may very well give us the upper hand against the Imperium. With their own self-imposed restrictions, we may have an opening against them and be able to adapt where they can't, if need be. Finally, on the note of the Astartes and the other super-soldier units we have encountered both on Axum and from rumors outside of the system, it is much intriguing to me how little power these military assets hold within the larger Imperium. The Astartes appear to be organized into largely autonomous groups known as chapters, they also tend to answer very little, only taking orders from the administrative state and at times the Inquisition. Despite the autonomy, however, 
very few of these chapters seem to wield any real power over the larger imperial polity, many simply governing themselves as opposed to interfering with who they regard as their lessers. As well as this, the population of Astartes is incredibly small, seemingly on purpose for a, as of yet, unknown reason. The maximum number of Astartes allowed per chapter seems to be around 1,000, and many still do not keep even remotely close to that number. This intrigues me greatly, seeing as how efficient these space marines are on the field of battle. Like a vestigial claw, the Astartes by all accounts appear to have once been the backbone of the Imperial military due to their effectiveness on the battlefield and their nature as written in the few historical accounts we do have. This makes me wonder greatly why they have been so seemingly and purposely decreased in size so drastically. Perhaps supply issues? A rebellion of sorts? This is something I greatly wish to research further. Enough of my musings, however, as there is one final possible faction of super soldiers the Imperium may very well possess. I would like to note that our only information regarding what I will discuss next comes from the accounts of captured prisoners of war, mostly high-ranking personnel, and because of that should be regarded with a grain of salt. However, due to the number of times this group has come up, and due to the secretive and totalitarian nature of the Imperium as a whole, I feel it is needed that the possible existence of this group be entertained. This final group has been called many names by those our forces have interrogated. The Golden Warriors, the Guardians of the Emperor, the Imperial Guardians, and finally their most common name, the Custodes. As I said, little is known about this group, and even the little we do know is conjecture and the words we have tortured out of Imperial commanders, but what they have told us is disturbing to put mildly. The Custodes appear to be the personal guardians of the Emperor of Mankind back in their home galaxy and are quite possibly the most dangerous warriors the Imperium of Man can field. It is said that a single space marine is worth 100 men, an estimate I can personally attest to seeing how many of our clone forces are needed to take down only one Astarte. Then it is said that a single custode is worth 100 space marines. It is unknown currently how many, if any at all, custodes are fielded within the Imperial force that has found their way to our doorstep. However, even one of these beings poses a threat so massive to our military assets that I don't even know if we have anything that would be able to counter them. However, this may very well all be nearly completely pointless. In all reality, the Imperium of Man may not be the biggest threat on our doorstep, and our war against this enemy may very well be nothing more than a waste of time. And I think you may understand this as well, Chancellor. In order to understand what I am about to say, I must explain briefly and simplistically one of the most important theories ever devised on the nature of civilizations and cosmic society. This theory, of course, is the general theory of cosmic sociology. Devised around 40 years ago by Kwati sociologist and researcher Julève Louis, this theory in a basic sense posits that all civilizations, from the lowest hunter-gatherer societies to the largest and most complex spacefaring polities, can be categorized into three main categories. Prey, predator, and parasite. Societies may change category over time. For example, a predator society through stagnation and collapse may become a prey society, much like an animal may evolve and become weaker after environmental pressures are lifted. But all societies always fall into one of these categories. In order for a society to fall into one of these categories, it must first meet certain types of criteria. The exact number of criteria met is not important, only that one society meets one set of criteria more than the other. And the category with the most criteria met is what category this given society falls into. To explain further, here is a list of but a few criteria for each given category. Predator society criteria. Fast to act. Propagation of society is built primarily on the conquest of other societies. Military and diplomatic action is primarily done in an offensive manner. First to initiate conflict. Constantly looking to expand society's given territory. Culture is built primarily on the expansion of the military of the given society. Contains one massive or multiple smaller programs of colonization and subjugation of rival societies. 
resource extraction is built primarily on the theft or conquest of rival societies. Prey society criteria, slow to act. Propagation of society is built primarily on the survival of gained territory rather than conquest. Military and diplomatic action is primarily done in a defensive manner, last to initiate conflict unless territory is disturbed, hesitant to expand territory, typically but not always a former predator society who have stagnated. Culture is built primarily on the avoidance of conflict. Culture is built primarily on the defense of the given society. Parasite society criteria, slow to act when idle, fast to act when disturbed. Propagation of society is built primarily on a relationship with a larger society. Military and diplomatic action is primarily done sparingly and on a much smaller scale, unable to initiate large-scale conflict, possesses very little if no territory at all. Typically, but not always, the remnants of a former predator or prey society who have been nearly annihilated by a conflict. Culture is built primarily on the avoidance of notice by larger societies. Culture is built primarily on beneficial relationships with larger societies. For some examples of each society, look no further than the galaxy we live in today. For example, the Republic is an almost perfect example of a prey society. The Republic prior to the onset of the Clone Wars was incredibly slow to act. The culture was built on the avoidance of conflict at any cost. And even when the war began, it was the last to initiate conflict and its main goal was to protect territory gained in thousands of years past. The Separatists, on the other hand, is a rather straightforward example of a predator society. They were the first to initiate this war and first to expand territory, and their entire society is built on the attempt to exert themselves as a polity through violence and conquest. For a parasite society, look no further than the varied amounts of criminal societies that scatter the outer rim. From the Mandalorians to the Huts to the Pikes, all these societies exist as shadows of their former selves, remnants of societies that were annihilated by the Republic's early conquests. They possess very little territory, and they only act to gain the favor of other, larger societies in order to ensure their survival. Now that I have explained the basics of this theory, it is finally time I explain the reason behind my conclusion. To put it simply, from all the research I have done, it appears the Imperium of Man, rather than a predator society, is in fact a prey society. Out of the criteria of a predator society, the Imperium of Man meets two, arguably three, criteria. Out of the prey society criteria, the Imperium meets five. The Imperium, like an invasive species to a much tamer environment, appears to only be a predator to us. Like a rancor put anywhere other than their home, it reigns in most conflicts it is engaged in. But back in its home, back in its natural environment, it is but prey fighting off predators of unimaginable cruelty. The Imperium may only be the way it is simply due to the fact that it has to be in order to survive. The predators it may face may well be so inhuman and so dangerous that they may very well have made the Imperium in the form we fight against now. However, like all invasive species, the existence of the Imperium in our galaxy is attracting its natural predators slowly but surely. It is my opinion we may have already seen glimpses of these predators in the War of Axum itself, rumors of horrors so foreign and utterly alien to our galaxy that they may very well be just glimpses of the predators the Imperium has faced in their natural habitat. Rumors of our forces going mad and mutating into barbaric beasts, alien creatures armed in biologically created armor and weapons, and even sentient beings of the force itself so malicious they taint the very land they stand upon have run wild since our arrival. And I fear those rumors are only the beginning of the horror we will face. Like two male Lothayan deer fighting over who the forest belongs to, we do not notice the wolves in the bushes all around us. And if we continue to waste our energy on this fight, we will stand no chance against the hungry predators on our doorstep. I hope you take my words into consideration, Chancellor. I do not know what to do now, but I do know the gravity of what we face. Thank you for your time. Regards, Admiral Thrawn.